Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be with you. Midweek editions here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. What soccer jersey are you rocking? It's Tottenham Hotspur. Gazoon tight. I think you made that joke before, actually, when but, we were in this jersey. They're the pride of North London. Some people will tell you that's Arsenal. They are wrong. Arsenal are a South London club at heart, and they moved across the River Thames up to North London. They're imposters. Tottenham is the true North London team, and uh, they, they, they fell today. Do you see uh, the, uh, the Peaky Blinders episode where they had the tunnel under the Thames? No. Ooh, okay. Well, they, they, I would assume they were drawing back on their World War I experience tunneling. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I know, not, I know enough about this show to know what the premise that episode is most likely like. But I Season 2. It. Check her out. Pretty good. Back into Season 2? It might have been, yeah. I, I, it might have been the season finale. I, I, say, I, I finished season one and got into season two, but never finished it. All right, get the uh, homework, homework, homework. Got to love you some Peaky Blinders. Hey, we will dive in today. Thoughts on Trev as he had his radio show last night. Uh, when it comes to metrics, maybe you're metrics out, but we'll spend a little bit of time. Some commentary from Rick Neuheisel as well on how the Frost metrics and if and do they apply to Mickey Joseph. So we'll, uh, d- we'll go there. In this first hour, we'll spend time with Mike Babcock from HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Get Babber's take on the metrics and the rest of the season ahead. Uh, Mike Shuhart, Wilderness Ridge Golf. We'll talk to Shuey, get some football thoughts from him, and, of course, golf. Great time of year fall golf out at Wilderness Ridge in hour two long long time Nebraska assistant and senior offensive analyst Ron Brown will be with us in one hour and then Bill Bender from the Sporting News so nice you'll hear him twice Uh, Bill Bender with us here in hour two numbers to get in can join us today on Hale Varsity Radio 466-3776-800-825-5865 those are the numbers to get in can email the show chris at hailvarsity.com and you're welcome to stream us watch the show do so on a couple of different ways one you can do it on facebook espn lincoln's facebook or a couple of different twitter channels the hail varsity radio twitter feed at h varsity radio or the espn lincoln twitter feed there you go so ask yourself this now that the uh, the, the metrics are no longer a mystery What'd you think of them? Six and six in a bowl game. Does that seem outlandish? No, it's the standard if you're a Nebraska fan. The fact that you're talking about just getting getting to six is low. It is. And it's a it's a one eighty schedule from last year to this year. And that's what Scott Frost would charge, was charged with doing. Get to a bowl game. Don't back into a bowl game. Don't start out 6-0 and or 5-1 and and limp to 6-6. Six and six. Now, it's, it's interesting, right? We didn't know what was to be in 2022. We knew the importance of Northwestern. We knew the importance of, even if you dropped that game, how huge Oklahoma would be. We didn't know Oklahoma was going to be garbage. We didn't know Wisconsin was going to, hey, Paul, let's go out back and reenact Goodfellas. We, we didn't know that was going to happen. Had no clue that in year two, the pig farmer was going to be a, a top 15 team. You kind of knew that Iowa might struggle on offense, but you didn't know they'd be this awful with, with Junior running the show. Safer bet, probably as safe a bet that that Frost would maybe not find his way through the rest of the season. That's a push for me. But Trev had to sit and wait. Okay, Trev saw what 
he thought was wrong, Trev looked at and said, let me help, let me help this dude. Let me mentor him. Let me try and mentor him. Here's how I know how Nebraska football is supposed to be and works. Scott, you know how Nebraska football is supposed to be and how it works. It's about toughness. And you get dudes that are willing to outlast the other dude and you sprinkle in some amazing talent. They did that through the portal this year. Great article by Sam McEwen on the recruiting, what the task is going to be for the next head football coach at Nebraska, whoever that is. The balancing act <laughs> where your, your recruiting ties were either California or Florida in your last two coaches, not the Midwest. But, but read Sammy's work. And it's, it's, it's a reality. So six wins in a bowl game to get an extension and another million added on. Do it. Handle it. You, you got a, a stay of execution last year because you're the homegrown guy. And politically, I honestly think that Trev probably had some money dudes that weren't willing to give the okay on the hit. To keep with the mob theme, who's with us? Got John on the line. John, go ahead. Thanks for calling. Hi, I spoke with the athletic director the other night, and uh, you know, I did ask. You know, I told him I was very happy how he was supporting our new interim coach, and told him how us old timers are smiling for the first time in about ten years, and I hope he keeps that into consideration, not just wins. But I did ask him, you know about is there going to be parity with him and the basketball coach? If the basketball coach starts off like he did last year and have the he has the second and third worst record ever in Nebraska history for uh, basketball coaches, uh, would he do the same thing in terms of getting rid of the coach and he sort of sidestepped that. Well, it's not and time that, to talk about it yet, John. I mean, let's see where things go with Fred. Fred, no, I just no, I just said, are you going to hold the same standard? I think things should be equal all the way along the line. And to have somebody that has the second or third worst seasons ever in, in the history of a sport, and how things lagged last year. But my major thing was, you want to have transparency and. That has just sort of made people think, why can't the people that are giving the money over the years at least have transparency? And I said, have you had that talk with, uh, put it on paper with the basketball coach? He says, no, I didn't have to. Scott Frost is so, he said Scott Frost wanted it on paper. Sure, because, you know, the, because you know. John, thanks for the phone call. Appreciate you listening. Listen, Scott asked for it, so there's going to be no... No question, right? It's in it's in paper. It's in black and white. You can't fire me if I get to a bowl game at six and six. There's a difference in how six and six looks if I'm Trev Alberts, period. Mm-hmm. So, and you can do a handshake with Fred. And I'd, I'd go as far as to say that now that I th- you can't do a handshake with Scott, but I, I think I think it speaks to the, the difference in relationship between a, a guy Thank like you. Scott Frost and, and Trev Alberts as opposed to to what the relationship is like behind the scenes between Fred Hoiberg and Trev Alberts, where there's more trust there, where where Fred goes, you know what, I, I trust your handshake agreement. We don't need to get it in paper because I trust that if if I hit the things that we set out preseason, I, I trust that you will then compensate me fairly, and I, I don't think. There was that trust. That, that's the read I get from needing this on paper, needing to have it signed. And I guess we'll see what this agreement actually looked like as as uh, some of those it's a uh, documents note, come brother. out. But, it's a post-it note or a cocktail mat. But, but it is in writing, and I think that just speaks to the, what the trust was like between Scott Frost and Trev Alberts before the season. Well, and listen, you, I think you have a guy who's been there and done it at a professional level and at a college level in, in Fred Hoiberg. Where Fred's like, yeah, I'm not getting it done. I deserve to to be shown the door. Versus, there's to me again from afar, it feels like an element. If I'm Trev, I've had to babysit for a year and a half. And okay, uh, I, I, sure, Scott. I guess we'll put it in writing. I guess my word's not good, or you need uh, you need reassurances in writing legally. We'll we'll go that route. But it's been, 
Well, here's Trev himself on, on the network, his radio show last night when it comes to the dreaded M word. It really, it really isn't a, a huge secret. What I wanted from Scott, and we talked about a lot, was incremental progress. And so what Scott and I had talked about is we needed to get to a bowl game. And not a backing into a bowl game, minimum of six games. And so if we could win six games and get to a bowl game, then we could sort of revert back to you know, his original contract. And, and so we'll, we'll release those. We're not going to appeal uh, this. I thought it was um, important and more of a sort of an HR type of personal improvement deal obviously the judge uh, viewed it differently so we'll we'll be releasing that uh, in the in the appropriate time but uh, I thought it would be fair on on the show tonight to just make people aware um, that's the extent of what those metrics look like is um, I, I wanted I wanted to see improvement and I thought it was a minimum level that we get to a bowl game and win at least six games are you getting better or does it look like you're better from start to finish Simple enough. And and listen, if if we get to this basketball football discussion, you could kind of see saying, "Well, I got six wins. Why are you firing me?" Versus, you know, I'm I'm 15 and 18. It's better, but it's still brutal. Um, yeah, I get it. I mean, I think there's a difference, maybe an outlook there. Rick Neuheisel weighs in from Sirius XM. When it comes to metrics, what does do, do, are are Mickey's metrics the same as Scott's? I know that they're searching. I I think they've got ten candidates out there because I know for a fact they've already reached out to one. This is putting Trev Alberts in the crosshairs, and I would just say to him, please, Trev, please get yourself together. So, do you think he was wrong for putting that clause in initially? You just say, I'm going to evaluate you at the end of the season. You, you, there's no reason to make those kind of assumptions and have them in, in writing. It makes no yeah. sense to me because you're bound to it. Rick Neuheisel, Skippy, has had 40 jobs, gotten paid handsomely, and left jobs, in my humble opinion, far worse than he found many of them. <laughs> All right. That's why he's doing radio. And I'll say this, if Mickey, not all six and sixes and bowl appearances are created equal. You walk into this and you get this team to six? That's incredible. That almost feels like eight if they get to a bowl game. If it gets them to seven and five, my God, that's impressive. You know, and, and Kent emails in with a good question. Say, say Scott would have, again, we're playing the hypothetical game. Say you got to six and six, but you lose the bowl game, so you're six and seven. You're still below 500. And you can just hear in Trev's tone back into a bowl game. I think Scott clearly doesn't, didn't want to be fired. I don't know that he wanted to, he was not not enjoying his time here, but it's one thing to, to have a job that you're miserable, miserable at or it looked like you were miserable at. And it's a completely another thing to, to to be the you know prodigal son that gets whacked, uh, and and the money will make things feel better a little bit. But still, um, you could have make the made the appearance that you wanted to fight for your job to stay here. And now it's clear they'll be released. We'll be able to talk about it more. I don't really disagree with the university's position of well, listen. Guy's no longer here. Does it matter anymore? And you don't have, you nailed it. Elijah Herbal nailed it with the, it speaks volumes that, that Fred doesn't have to have it written down. And then Scott wanted it written down uh, when it comes to trust issues. And listen, the guy who hired you gets uh, sent to his ranch. I loved Uncle Bill. He's a good dude to, to listen to, but from a job performance standpoint, there's, uh, there's question marks in hindsight. And right now, you've got a guy in Trev that's not the guy who hired you that's come in, and he's going to be your boss. He's going to pull you up in front of the media. Scott, get up here. You know? <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's the adult in the room making somebody mind, pulling him up, and it goes back to the, uh, the NCAA infractions. Scott, get up here. Come on.
No, I don't want to. <laughs> I mean, that's that. That's how that played out that day after practice. And Trev, what's Trev do? Trev gets up. He probably benches seven thousand pounds and then goes to work. Then he goes and benches seven thousand more pounds and goes back to work, right? And then he'll go to an event. And and that's what he would like people working for him to also be like. The optional hobby thing. What's your hobby? Well, it's working. And and I don't know that that was Scott. And and at the end of the day, when these metrics came out, I, it, it's I, so it, low. It's shallow. It's so shallow pool. It, I mean, it used to be if you went to five and seven or six and six, that was grounds for getting fired in Nebraska. It is, and it's a different, it's a different Nebraska. I know you got to build back up, Elijah, but and, and that's why my, my takeaway from this is less about the metrics themselves, but more about what that meant about the relationship between Frost and Trev Alberts behind the scenes. That, that's what I'm gleaning from this. Not anything about on-field performance or anything like that. It, it, it's done. That's in the past. But I think this just kind of shows again what that relationship looked like behind the scenes. Comes down to supervision. I'm going to supervise you, and you are going to do X, Y, and Z. Mike Babcock's on the way. Hail Varsity continues on a Wednesday. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. A little less than an hour away, Ron Brown going to be with us, senior analyst for Nebraska. Get his thoughts on the season so far. We welcome in. Mr. Husker Football, Mike Babcock with us at MD Babs on Twitter. Read him with HailVarsity.com and Magazine. Babbers, what do you know? I'm still pondering uh, Rick Neuheisel's comment. Should yeah, you know? like, oh no, you might have to keep Mickey. I mean, listen, Mickey's got a whale of a task. He's done a, a fantastic job of motivating and calming the waters. And we'll, we'll see. I mean, I mean, I just, it's I just, a national search, and that was up front and point number one Trev made. You're, you're not going to be forced to keep Mickey if you have somebody else uh, in mind and you think it's a better fit with more experience. You don't want to run Mickey off by by any means because of, of what value he has and, and, and has brought to the program. But I think Mickey and Trev are okay, right, moving forward with uh, with expectations but yeah that kind of bothered me here it's like no okay just because you, you set the standard for 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 frost at six wins in year five by the way doesn't mean if mickey mickey's got the job if it's if it's six maybe he does i don't know but that's between mickey and trev right now. well yeah and, and, and to add to that i mean i'm not going to sit here and say that i don't think that this the six and six number was also tied to, to scott frost's you know, employment status. People are saying, "Oh, well, this is just about the contract him reverting it." Well, if Scott didn't get to six and six, it would have been it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, it's Scott why, would have been gone anyway. That's why the October first was huge because yeah. your buyout dropped. Yep. You, know, you get popped by then and save some money. You couldn't but, wait any longer to do it. But then on top of that, this is an agreement between Scott and Trev. Is and Mickey understands that? Mm-hmm. I think so. Mickey understands that the, the, the standard that Scott was held to is not the standard that he is held to, and it's not the standard that future Nebraska coaches are going to be held to by Trev Alberts. Mickey, Mickey probably is going to lose his mind if they don't get to six and six. Babbers, knowing how competitive Mickey is. No, I, you know, I think that Mickey understands the situation very well. He understands the task ahead of him. He understands the dynamic of taking over a team three games into the season, um, the difficulty in trying to develop a system that you're comfortable with when you don't have players, a lot of players that you've recruited. I know he recruited some receivers. Um, He was involved in that. But it's just a whole different thing. I mean, Scott was in a situation where he'd recruited these classes he was the guy that made these decisions that got it to this point. Now Mickey has to take something that Scott did and turn it into something that he's comfortable with, that he believes that can uh, can be successful. I mean, I don't know how other people look at it, but the the last three games, even the Purdue game, they gave up 600 yards <laughs> and – they position where they could have won that game. Um, talk about grit. Yeah. You know, it's the Will Bull 
grit, sprint kind of. And this team has grit, and it, I, Ricky Joseph understands his situation. You know, he at the beginning he said we're going to do things as if we're going to be here, whether we're going to be here or not. Mm. You know, we're going to take that approach. He understands, and Trev Alberts is the athletic director. Rick Neuheisel isn't. Um, Trev Alberts understands the situation in a way that people on the outside don't understand because he played here. He was part of this program. He's shown that he can make difficult decisions. He showed that at UNO, um, eliminating the football program and and, uh, wrestling. Um, He took a lot of heat for that, but I think that the – it's Omaha University now. Mm-hmm. I think they're probably better off. They've got a great hockey program. He made the decisions that had to be made. He'll do it here, same way. What What was your take, uh, Babbers? With the uh, we got to write it down. We got to formalize the uh, the intentions here with this this metric. I like the largest observation that it showed the relationship between Scott compared to the relationship between Fred Hoiberg and, and Trev Alberts. And, you know, I don't know why it had to be written down. It was pretty clear what it was he would have to do in, in year five. You know, you, you gotta do you got to do something. You can't just rely on, well, they were close. We were close. You know, it, like no other team has been close in those games. Um, I, I didn't understand that. Uh, but, again, I'm – I'm looking at it from the outside, and I, I don't really understand the dynamic of it. Well, I didn't know why it had to be written down. That was pretty obvious. I mean, yeah, it's strange because when we're sitting here preseason this summer saying six wins is the minimum, Husker fans everywhere I don't think would have wanted Scott back if he didn't lead him back to a bowl game. So it, it's everyone knows. Everyone knew it. it. From Trev to Scott to me and Schmitty to every fan in Husker Nation probably knew that six wins was the minimum. Oh. Yeah, I mean, just talk to any fan, and they're going to—they're actually probably going to say seven, seven wins yeah. at this point, seven and five. I mean, it's—it's it's like, let, let's go beyond the six here, folks, because like that like was you generous. Earlier, you can be six and six and lose the bowl game. You're six and seven. So, yeah, six was so six was generous. Absolutely generous in year five. I, mean, I could, I could, with I, this schedule, as you said during our line change, I could see a scenario where Scott earned his money back and still got fired at the end of the season if you go six and six, go six and six, but you you limp through November and you end up losing your bowl game. You're at six and seven. I can still see Scott Frost getting fired. Yeah, don't, 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 uh, don't go one in, don't go one in five down the stretch and get a million dollar bump and a year extra on your contract. Hell no. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not happening. Mike Babcock's with us at MD Babs on Twitter. Mike, uh, let's look towards the rest of the season. Bye week, heal up. And then here comes Illinois. Here comes the meat grinder. I've said that all week, but that's what it is, man. You got, you got Illinois, then you got Minnesota and their line of scrimmage. And uh, it can get overwhelmed if you're uh, having to, to, to get on down in the trenches. Uh, Michigan, Wisconsin. Iowa to end it. Tough, tough road. Yeah. um, You know, I I looked up the the stats. This is just at at this point. It'll change with games over the weekend. But um, Nebraska's final five opponents, four of those five this week were ranked in the top five in total in defense in the Big Ten. Okay. The only one that wasn't was – Wisconsin, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so now you're going, you're looking at people are looking at this and saying, well, you got to win three of those five games. Three of those five games. What what three are you going to pick? I mean, it, Illinois has really surprised everyone, I think. Mm-hmm. And it is, is, is uh, on a roll here in the West Division. Then you play Minnesota here. You never know what's going to happen with P.J. Fleck. Right. Well, you knew you knew you were going to get out coached by Fleck, but now maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not so much. But you're and then you go to Michigan. You're not going to win in Ann Arbor. I'm I'm. You know, I'm projecting that with no great insight. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's probably one. You're so you're probably looking at winning three or four if you're going to get six wins, right? Mm-hmm. And I, it's just it's a difficult schedule. Mickey Joseph said it's a five-game season or whatever. 
Um, can they get it done? I'm, I'm skeptical, but, you know, if you showed me the statistics of the Purdue game and said, you know, how did this come out? Well, did Nebraska get blown out? 21 point be, difference is what it should have yeah. looked like. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd be skeptical, but um, it, it's a tough haul. It's a tough ask for Mickey Joseph. And, you know, I think it's unfair to say, well, if he doesn't get to this such and such a point, he shouldn't even be a candidate for that thing, because I think he should be. No, the job he's he's done is fantastic, and he's absolutely a candidate. And they're not they're not done yet either. I mean, I don't know what the win total is going to be, but they will be uh, throwing punches. Mike, uh, when we talk about Nebraska and and how they get to where Illinois is at. I never thought I'd say that. But how they get to where Illinois is at right now, how they climb up in the West and just overall, so we're not talking about, well, can the guy get to six in a bowl game? The, those better days ahead, uh, potentially for Nebraska football. What's the turnaround time? Can you, can you be a serviceable line by next year? Can you be a better offensive and defensive line by next year, or is it a two- to three-year haul here? Well, you've got some young guys that can get some, get some experience, and you've got to get on the recruiting trail. Or recruiting is, a, is really an important part of this thing, especially now with NIL mm-hmm. and the transfer portal. I mean, it's a whole different dynamic in, in how you go about doing things like that. So, it's, it's you know, I don't know if you can get it turned around in, in a season because whoever is the head coach – even if it's Mickey with the limited time that he's had this, that he would have had this season, um, you still, it, it's going to take a little bit of time to get everything settled in, how you're going to recruit and so forth. Um, but within a couple of seasons, I, you know, I, the expectation has to be, you've got to be competitive in the big 10 West division. You know, you've got, you know, not six and six in a bowl game. It's got to be competitive in the West division. You know, that's that's where the program has to get. And you look at it right now, um, yeah, again, it's a tough, like I said, it's a tough go down the stretch of those five games. But Nebraska is in a position where realistically, if you looked at it and said, well, Nebraska still has a chance. Um, but it's a it's a rough it's a rough go that schedule. That's the that's the problem. But it's a very competitive Western Division. They 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 have been competitive this year since Mickey's taken over, and um, the charge is to, to to continue to be competitive with some wins along the way next year and beyond. And that's what was supposed to have been built up the last five years with this long runway, uh, given to the guy who knew how to build, at least what it took to build, right? The the brick and mortar for uh, winning on the lines of scrimmage. Babbers, uh, real quick here, we have about uh, 30 seconds. Hail Varsity Magazine, really fun issue coming out. Yeah, we got the uh, what if uh, sequence, uh, six of those. And as I've said before, a really good story on soccer um, and, and just a lot of good stuff in there. Um, you know, Quentin did a great job with the with the graphics. You know, getting the, the what ifs kind of thing, and uh, had a fun time putting that stuff together. So already we had somebody uh, text and want to know some what if about if Bo had been retained as coach and Lamar Jackson had come here. Exactly. Yeah, the what if. Mike Babcock from HailVarsity.com and Magazine. Babbers, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time at Hale Varsity. We're presented by Currency. Ron Brown, 25 minutes away. Bill Bender, Sporting Nudes. The, uh, I said nudes, news, forgive me. That was a real bad mistake. Hey, I'd subscribe to that magazine, the Sporting Nudes, baby. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> Shuey is now just hung up on us. Mike Shuey, Art Wilderness Ridge Golf with us. Shuey, how are you? I'm good. I'm waiting for the nudes to come out. <laughs> well, if you go back to that classic movie, Billy Madison, uh, Wednesday was Nudie Magazine Day. So there you have it. Um, I don't know where to go. Let me ask you about uh, 
metrics, my friend. That's been the topic today. What do you uh, <laughs> what do you think of the old uh, layout by Trev and and metrics and uh, the six and six number? It seemed absurdly low. Incredibly low. It's like wow. It's like way to reach for the stars. It's like come on. <laughs> But I guess you got to start somewhere, right? You know what, though? I, I bet you money he's like, he isn't going to, I've been around here long enough to know that it isn't going to happen. No way. Right? So I'm going to set it at six, and he isn't going to get there, and I'm going to be patient. The, uh, the politics that are involved in being an AD when it comes to boosters and perception and all that good stuff, man, you've got you've to gotta have uh, nimble feet, Chewy. No question. I mean, that's a delicate little balancing act of a lot of moving parts, trying to keep everybody engaged, and it's I don't envy his position. Mike Schuart's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio, and Mike, Rick Neuheisel brought up a point this morning uh, about Mickey Joseph and, and these metrics, saying, well, now is, is Trev going to be in the crosshairs from Mickey Joseph if, if Mickey were to go 6-6 six and six this season? Say, well, you, you told the last guy that, that if he went 6-6, six and six, that'd be good enough and you'd get his money back. Are, are you saying to me now that if I go 6-6, six and six, I, I should be deserving of this job? Are, are you of that opinion that now with these metrics out in the open air that, that it can cause some problems for Trev moving forward? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, Trev's got to do what Trev's got to do to – make the best decision for the uh, the team and going forward. So it's like, you know, it's totally different. You know, you had a guy that was coming in as a head coach, supposed to be uh, a guy that could do what he was supposed to do and didn't do it. You know, Mickey's in a totally different situation. You know, it, it would be a little tough, though, if he does go 6-6. Six and six. Here's a guy that's taking over – a train wreck and actually makes it work. So, um, I don't know. It'll be, it'll be interesting. But again, I mean, you have to search, you have to have some criteria that you're looking for in a search that you need and feel comfortable with. That's going to be able to do the job. And it's like, you need a candidate that checks all the boxes. Well, to to me, I look at it and I go, it's it's all common sense. If if Scott didn't get to six and six, I think everyone in Nebraska knew that Scott wasn't going to get another go around. And I think similarly, just about everyone in Nebraska knows that if Mickey can get this team, which looked like a train wreck early in the season, to six and six, he's going to have a good shot at becoming the head coach six, himself. It's eight. six feels like nine, doesn't it? <laughs> nine, nineteen, man, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it's all just common yeah. sense, though, to me. You said it best right there. Common sense. Sometimes people lose their common sense and a lot of the stuff it's like we just where's the common sense when it comes to the, some of these uh, decisions and that, that are being made and looking at certain things what is just the common sense of it well so so sometimes, sometimes it feels like try to make it bigger than it really is sometimes it feels like the, the more money is involved the less common sense there can be right no question that's always the root of of the problems it seems like Shuey, i want to ask you about tom brady and his performance, and he seems to be even more cranky on the sideline, uh, things that are not going well on and off field for him. And you've been a pro athlete at the highest level with the PGA. Are, are, does home life in situations like that, can it really, have you seen it really derail uh, performance? If, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Does that saying hold true on the exactly golf course that. or gridiron? Yeah, in both directions, too. You can see certain things that that players, you know, players that have their first child sometimes. Mm-hmm. It settles things down for them, and they become better at what they do. You know? It, I think every it's so individual with all the players and how certain situations affect them. But no question, I mean... It's, it's hard to do your job at that level that you need to do it at, first of all. And then you have outside distractions. Well, those distractions are going to affect that. You know, it takes a really certain player that can eliminate those distractions at that time to perform like they need to. That is really hard to do. I mean, it's, 
you only have so much mentally, which erodes away from your physical, you know, to be able to perform at the level that they're being asked to perform at, man, you got to have it 100% there all the time, you know. If it's only 80, 70, 60, I mean, your performance is going to be influenced by that. Well, I mean, look at Tom Brady. That's what I brought up. I mean, his exactly. his off-field issues with Giselle, I mean, he's he's been a mess. He's been a mess, and he's screaming at people. He, he'd scream, but now everyone's watching him scream because of the Giselle drama. And he's well, bringing, that to, bringing that to work. Yeah. You add his age to it, too. Yeah. You know, there's a point where it's like you're – your body can only do certain things, you know. Your mind is telling you to do this, but your body, I mean, no spring chicken, you know. <laughs> so it's like that adds a frustration level to it as well because it's like things that you used to be able to do when you were 25, him 35, you know, are not as easy to do now at his age. And you add the other components to it, and it becomes a very frustrating thing, and it's hard to not get frustrated, and those frustrations eventually boil over. Mike Schuart's with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf, uh, great time of year. Shuey, just a quick couple of minutes, bud. What's going on this fall at Wilderness? I'm sure the trees are just gorgeous, uh, all surrounding uh, just an impeccable ball, a golf course. Yeah, like you get, fall golf is so awesome. You get, like, this afternoon, man, it was cold this morning, but this afternoon is awesome. Trees are turning, you know, so it's beautiful out. You know, the weather's beautiful, so this is my favorite time of the year to play golf. Are you able to sneak out there, Cowboy, and uh, get a round or two in? Every now and then. I've, I've played a few more rounds uh, here at the end of the season than I was able to all season, so I try to sneak out there when I can. Well, you need to. You deserve it, man. I mean, the uh, facilities are incredible. The uh, swim-up bar, I know, is on hiatus, but... Soon enough, it'll be uh, warm again for uh, oh yeah for for those that need to hydrate to find their way. Uh, exactly. Should we, if folks want to inquire, come see you about some lessons, or for sure talk uh, membership? How do they do that? Yeah, just go to our website wildernessridgegolf.com. dot com. It has all the information on there. Whether it's memberships you're looking for, whether it's uh, information about lessons, club fitting. I mean, it's all on there. All your contact information is there. Um, just contact us and we can take care of kind of anything that you're looking for. Answer any of the questions you have. That sounds good. Shuey, always love uh, chatting with you. Thanks for jumping on, bud. You bet. Thanks for having me. Stay safe. There he is. Mike Shuart, Wilderness Ridge. Ron Brown coming up in 15 minutes. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Well, courtesy of Pat McAfee, we'll have... uh, a letter penned by Lou Holtz here in a little more than an hour. A lot of emails to get to. First, Ted, loyal listener, writes in, Offensive lines generally take three to four years to develop. If they missed a, a couple of development years, that becomes five or six years. We, Nebraska, need good teachers and consistency. We're presented here at Hale Varsity Radio by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Ted's on it. And that's, that's how do you, whoever it is, fix the O-line and D-line? Well, first and foremost, you still got years with what's here. So get those kids better, first and foremost. And if there's a ceiling, you got to go get better. So go get Juco, go Portal, and pray to God it comes together sooner rather than later. I'll look at, let's, let's look at Illinois for a minute. Okay. Illinois went to, to one bowl game with Lovey. They extended it, then they popped him. But Lovey brought in good line of scrimmage talent, spe- specifically the, the defensive side. And while Bielema is good and was able to have a, a really great start to year two and was right on the cusp in year one, he knew what he was doing, and he had a good uh, good pantry full of groceries. Right? Whoever comes in here will have to evaluate – keeping with this uh, th- this grocery take, what's here and what wins and know that. And then go have some connections in the Midwest, be able to hit some JUCOs, go portal, 
but you're going to have to to pull a, a Mel Tucker, not 11 and two, but hit to to bridge you, and then go load up and 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 let it go slow and low like uh, Elijah's pork. Butt. Well, well, look at uh, that pork butt I had this this weekend was delicious, by the but way. That's what it's going to take. You're going to need a bridge and then a reinforcement and and be right with that first class you bring in. I mean, look, look at Tennessee. Those guys looked terrible under Josh Heupel. But then that same talent got coached up for two years, and it's, it's mostly Josh Heupel's leftover talent that is now going and beating Alabama for Tennessee. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's, uh, Getting dudes to the program was never an issue for Tennessee. They always had some jack wagon leading them. And now they have a coach that, that has emphasized development, has mm-hmm. emphasized uh, physicality, and has turned that program into something. And I don't think that the pantry is bare for whatever coach is, is going to be next at Nebraska. I, I think there's some places there's where some, limitations. Some, some serious upgrades and some serious development is needed, specifically along the offensive line. And unfortunately, in the Big Ten, that's the, the one you need to, to be successful quickly. Is you need to turn that offensive line around quickly. And I, I think there needs to be a talent infusion there because these guys haven't developed at all in, in the two or three years that they've been on campus, the guys that we see on the fields on Saturday right now. But I, I'm not saying that I think all these guys are a lost cause. I think with some development, with some added talent infusion, I think you can turn that offensive line around, maybe not in one off season, but give it two years. They did it at Tennessee. It's been done at Illinois. It's it's It shouldn't be impossible. It shouldn't be as hard as Nebraska has made it look over the past eight seasons. Comes, comes down to coach. And Todd emails in, if six wins was the metric to keep his job, uh, what's the case for him getting fired then after three games? I mean, you, you saw the three games, I saw the three games, and it was also an evaluation, a carryover from the previous season. Because before this season even started, Todd, you had things reconfigured contractually, and you had D-Day on October 1st. So this was about an eight or nine game evaluation for uh, from Trev. And after that Georgia Southern game, did you actually think Scott Frost was going to get to six and six? No. Absolutely not. Ron Brown, he'll talk this season with us. Uh, Hour two on the way with Hale Varsity. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back into it, it's Hour 2. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. We welcome in longtime coach at Nebraska, senior offensive analyst Ron Brown back with us. Coach, have you caught your breath uh, another bye week? <laughs> but it's been, a, it's been a long season. How you doing? <laughs> good, good, Schmitty. It has been a long year, man. I mean, it's the second bye week, which extends the season even longer, but... I love it. I love I love college football. I love coaching. I love being around it. So a little longer season, no bother. But it just does seem like a long time, uh, you know, when we had the uh, Ireland trip and everything else to go along with it. Yeah, we, that seems just from our standpoint, eons ago. Uh, we went over sure. and, and covered uh, the, the game over there. and But we're, I yeah. mean, man, we're already halfway through the, the college football season. You just look at the, the number of weeks. So, kind of it flies by, but it, it feels forever ago. And I want to get your take on just how uh, how you think uh, things have gone as far as the response with all sorts of transition this season. Yeah, you name it. <laughs> transition. We've been transition city for the last couple of years, and uh, uh, it's been uh, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind. But you know, one of the things that I've really tried to adopt in my life, Schmitty, in the last uh, uh, number of years as a coach, is to be heavy on the truth and light on my feet. And when when that happens, I think uh, uh, no matter what happens out there with all the shifting and things that go on, changing of the guard, you name it, mm-hmm. uh, I can I can rest and thank the Lord that um, he has me uh, here for a purpose. Ron Brown with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, you have had the pleasure of, of coaching a lot of years at Nebraska, and you've done it in different 
different decades, and I look at, at your time in Lincoln when Mickey Joseph showed up as a recruit and, and as a player, and now Mickey's uh, leading the guys as, as interim head coach. What, what traits do you see from Mickey the player that serve him well as a coach? Well, you know, it's ironic, uh, Schmitty, because my first recruiting assignment when I came here uh, to the University of Nebraska as a coach, Coach Os- Osborne hired me in 1987. He and I hopped into a uh, car, uh, drove up to Omaha, and we met uh, Leotis Flowers, who was uh, a player at Central High School there. And we dropped off my wife with his wife, Nancy. And he said, hey, we're getting in a private jet, and we're heading down to New Orleans, and we're going to see Mickey Joseph. And so we flew down there and went to see Mickey at his high school at Archbishop Shaw there in New Orleans. And uh, so, yeah, Mickey came, of course, signed with us and uh, uh, played his career here at the, at the University of Nebraska. And has done a really good job in a, in a tough situation. Uh, he's hats off to him. He's he's done a, I think uh, he's really done a tremendous job uh, for the little bit of time so far that he's had to take over and and in, in a discombobulated situation. Okay, I want to go back to that that first meeting, the private jet. You go to New Orleans. I'll ask about mm-hmm. the jambalaya in a little bit uh, if it was uh, <laughs> memorable. But what was your what was your first impression of Mickey? Uh, Fun loving, exciting, high energy, the, the same Mickey that you know today. Um, when you guys interview him, you see all that energy and. And a lot of one-liners and sparkle in the eye and all of that. Uh, a lot of confidence. That that was Mickey. Mickey was a was was a high school All-American. Um, so he was USA Today. I think the top quarterback or whatever you run pass kind of combination quarterback. So he's always been an athletic guy. He had great speed, um, but but a good talker and and uh, very smart, very very sharp that way. Ron Brown, few minutes with us here. Hale Varsity Radio, senior offensive analyst. And, Coach, how was Mickey and, and the rest of the assistants, you, uh, your time around the, the program as well, how were you able to, to try and stabilize? I think people will take the lead of someone who looks calm and has uh, a sense of, of gravity and confidence. And so if you're anxious, if you're bitter, if you're wagging your head and your head's down all the time, uh, that's not a lot to, for someone else to look at and, and get confident over. These players are looking for, they're looking for an opportunity to be resilient. And, you know, you, you think about how life is today with a lot of youngsters. They come from... Uh, situations that are tough. There's this, you know, things that are not reliable, reliable all the time for them. And and so one of the things that have, that's always been good here, uh, and I know just going back to Coach Osborne, his consistency. I think we had a lot of players who came from inconsistent situations, but because of his consistency, uh, they were able to grasp onto that. And I think the assistants, we, uh, began to reflect the consistency of Coach Osborne. And then the fact that you didn't change coaches all the time. You know, Coach Osborne was here for 25 years as the head coach. And assistants here hardly ever left. And so in in the midst of a crazy rock'em, sock'em world, you had one place here – here in in this building here, this football building, where the one thing you could count on was consistency. You could count on the fact that people were going to be here, that uh, you didn't have to change the playbook every year. You didn't have to, you know, uh, go out and reinvent the wheel. Uh, You you had the same faces, and, and those players could count on that. And it bred consistency in their life, I believe. And that's what I think Mickey's done a good job of, of trying to restore that in the midst of, again, um, the whole bunch of things going on at the same time. You had opportunities to leave Florida State, I'm sure NFL. What what kept Nebraska home? Hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I, I, I was thinking about that. You know, why did I stay here so many years? And 
and uh, it's my 29th year here. Um, I I really believe that the Lord um, kept me here uh, because I think there is there's a time and a place for longevity. Um, it's rare these days. You know, when I first got into coaching, people were telling me, you can't stay at a place any longer than three years. You've got to keep hopping around like a, like a bunny rabbit, you know? <laughs> and and I, I thought about that, and I was kind of influenced at that at first, and I was entertaining this guy, this guy, this group, this coach, uh, all these different places. But I began to see that, you know, a couple things, Smitty. One is um, Nebraska was not a real – um, jump around place. It was a destination. It wasn't a temporary place. It was a place that a lot of people wanted to coach at. It was at a very high level. We were playing at a very high level. But 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 even more importantly than that, I, I was involved in a purposeful ministry outside of football. And, and football helped bring and spread that around the state. But I had a place called in the state of Nebraska that I, that I really grew to love. My wife and I became very uh, affectionate with the state, and and uh, so we started to see this place is not j- just a football place. It was a place where we could honor the Lord, um, bring glory to His name, use the vehicle of football and other opportunities to pour into the lives of people. So um, that's why it was it became even increasingly more difficult to leave, even when I had the chance to. Ron Brown with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, you've coached running backs. Uh, you're a senior offensive analyst now. You've coached wideouts and tight ends, and you've seen a lot of dudes. Uh, what do you think of Trey Palmer, not just against Purdue, but uh, his uh, ability to, to transfer in and do what he's done? Yeah, you know, one thing I say about Trey when I, when I look at him, as I say, man, this guy will never die of an old. He doesn't seem to worry about very much. <laughs> he's pretty relaxed out there. He's having fun. He's having a smile. And you know what? He's a very confident guy. He's a nice kid. He's very confident, though. He's got some swag to him. And you know what? There's something that uh, that else that really helps him in that. He's got a lot of speed, man. <laughs> this boy can run. <laughs> he can run. And, and he's got real good field speed. Um, yeah. And I think uh, – I think, uh, Coach Mickey and Coach Cassano, Mike Cassano, our wide receiver coach, has done a, a tremendous job just diagnosing what Trey has to go against each week. I mean, there's going to be people that, that are out there and they're working their different techniques and specialized things to contain him. And I thought, you know, I sat in on all those, you know, meetings and I just listened to Coach Cassano address some of the techniques and different things that, that, the, that the kids are going to have to go against the wide receivers and they were really well prepared for Purdue. I mean, I'm not surprised at what Trey did, although anytime you go over 200 yards and break a school record, that's pretty impressive. But he was well prepared by Mike Cassano. So I hats off to, to Mike, and I'm just glad to be able to serve in any capacity that I can. And, uh, and it's fun to see Trey whizzing down the, down the field over and over again uh, with big plays. But we realize that, you know what, man? That's just not automatic. You have to you have to prepare. It isn't like you just step on the field and it all turns into a pot of gold. It takes work. And Trey came off of an in, injuries uh, from the Rutgers game, and so I thought it was a really impressive. I thought he did a great job of uh, of getting ready for that game. And but we got stiff, stiff competition the rest of the year, as everybody knows. Coach, you, you, you mentioned the confidence from Trey. How did you tackle that job in your career, being able to, uh, I don't want to say deal with, that's the wrong term, but the, the wide receiver position's notorious for for confidence, uh, sometimes overconfidence. Uh, how are you able to navigate that and, and continue to, to get the best out of kids? Well, you know, I think one thing um, – Way back in the day, uh, when I was for, when I first came here, coaching wide receivers, tight ends, and wingbacks, I had three positions. I had fifty guys. You know, we had close to two. We had around two hundred guys on our team back then. So I had fifty guys myself, 
here I am, a 30-year-old, fresh out of the Ivy League, who had not coached a down of uh, – you kidding me? Offensive football, I had been a defensive player in college. I coached defense, and now I had come here and have to coach three positions on offense to get at the same time. And so I, I just – I had to learn along the way. And Coach Osborne was very patient with me. And one of the things that I, I, I learned as I looked at these guys is that you you better be tougher than them. i got to be tougher than them. And what I mean by that doesn't mean I'm screaming and yelling every, every five minutes at them. It means that you better make sure that you are comfortable in your own skin mm-hmm. And that you don't you you don't get all hurt by feelings and so forth, and you have to have I think you have to be able to draw some lines and say, "Look, we'll go to this point, but we don't go any further than that point. This is how we talk in here this is how we this is how we operate in this situation. This is what is demanded on the field and off the field. We're not missing classes." We're, and, and you know what? There's not going to be one calculated loaf on this field. And every single time there's a calculated loaf on this field, we're going to address it. We're going to address it. It's going to be reward and rebuke. So I just feel like I had to be tougher. It was almost like I think a parent has to be tougher than their child. Mm-hmm. For that child to become all that that child's supposed to be, the parent can't just give in and just say, well, whatever the child wants to do, I'll, I'll allow it because I want to be liked. And I think that's true in coaching. There's, there's a lot of coaches that want to be liked or they want to be, you know, they want to be, uh, you know, popular among the players. And I feel like you have to f- be willing to forfeit that. It doesn't mean you, 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 you get to be an idiot and just be an antagonistic uh, guy that just puts a heavy hand on them and everything they do. No, it means that you love them. But I used to tell Dana Brinson years ago, Remember, Dana was a great player for way us, back, a wing back, right? yeah. way back, yeah. I say, Dana, those who really love you will discipline you. People who really love you will discipline you because they want to see you flourish. They want to see all of your God-given ability to happen. And unless you're tough in this world, that will never happen. If you don't guard the things that would take one away from seeing that God-given potential flourish in a kid's life, if you are tempted as a coach or a parent or a teacher or a leader of any sort to want to just kind of fit in and be liked by everybody, you'll fail that kid. And that's, that's uh, the Lord just kind of put, uh, put that on my heart, and I was raised that way with my mom and dad. They raised it. You know, I was a foster kid, adopted, and they said, look, this is how we this is how it is in this home. These are the ground rules. Are there any questions? <laughs> you know, and and from that point on, it was submission. And from that, I think because my mom and dad were so tough, they taught me, they taught me what love was truly all about. And I'm able to love them way more because of that. And then I'm able now to love others that way. So I'm I'm very thankful for. The, the the kind of leadership that I had along the way, and that helped me lead other young men along the way. Ron Brown, senior offensive analyst, longtime coach at Nebraska. Coach, we'll let you go. We'll do this again soon, and enjoy the bye week, and uh, we'll be uh, following along here the rest of the season. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Schmitty. Always great to talk to you. God bless you, buddy. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hail Varsity Radio, presented by Currency College Football NFL man Bill Bender with us from the Sporting News at Bill Bender 92 is where you follow him on Twitter. Sportingnews.com is where you go to read all his insights. Bill, what a college football season it's been. Great weekend of action. Last weekend, NFL keeps getting interesting. How are you doing, man? We're all at the midway point right now. Oh, it's just, you know, you have fun each day with it. Um, certainly, uh, the season goes by fast. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that you and I were shaking hands at uh, Big Ten Media Day. <laughs> <No>. And now <laughs> so much has changed just from that moment to now. So uh, 
Yeah, very excited to get into the second half. It ought to be a lot of fun. The big change being Mickey Joseph. As uh, we know, Nebraska's season was a topic of conversation. As you look at Mickey, and, and you have great history with the Nebraska football program, what do you think of him being 2-2 two and two right now, and Nebraska still within striking distance of a bowl game? Yeah, I love the fight. I mean, obviously, okay, so I don't really count the Oklahoma game because you're, you're thrust into that position. You know, you probably screw scrambling just to get a game plan together and Oklahoma made a statement in that game but ever since then they've shown fight I watched a a large portion of that Purdue game I actually picked Nebraska to win that game I thought they would win because I I like the fight that Joseph has shown the defense has improved Um, so yeah I mean for them a bull game isn't out of the question and you know just continued improvement you wonder if it gets to that point will they take a hard look at keeping Joseph full term I don't know that they will but it's a possibility. Well, he's going to make them think about it just because of how they're they're fighting. I mean, there are just some deficiencies that go beyond Mickey. I mean, there's not enough duct tape and uh, and chewing gum with with just from a development standpoint of of where Nebraska's at. And Bill, you've seen this on the lines of scrimmage. What do you think of the West? Do you think it's down because of where Wisconsin? and Iowa are at, or do you say, okay, so they're not full strength, but look at what, what Bielema and Illinois got going. No, I don't think it's down. I just think there's parity because, you know, you go it, going into last week, six of the seven teams were 500 or better mm-hmm. going in, into last week's games, which to me, that's parity. I mean, Northwestern has kind of struggled since the season opening victory. Um, but Illinois, I mean, I'm not going to fault their success. I, I think what Brett Bielema is doing is awesome. The fact that they were able to go through um, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, the three kind of teams that you look at traditionally pretty physical and beat all three. He has a system he believes in. He knows how to win in the Big Ten West. I think they're going to Indianapolis. I think even if they beat, lose to Michigan, I, I think they're the team that's headed to Indianapolis. And I didn't, when I was talking to you at Big Ten Media Day, Chris, I had no idea that uh, Illinois Purdue would be the biggest game in the Big Ten West potentially. Uh, me neither. <laughs> me, me neither. I mean, we both kind of thought, all right, a lot of losses for Purdue with Carl Loftus and Bell and, 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 and uh, Rondale. And I know Rondale's been in the league a little longer but my point is you have some of those explosive playmakers gone but Brom just keeps finding the way with uh, with walk-ons and keeps guys in the program and they're they're good enough and you know uh, Purdue uh, just keeps doing their thing but Bielema his line's a scrimmage he's a defensive guy anyway and then he has meshed what he had from Lovey on top of his own recruiting that defense is uh, unless you're playing it a lot of fun to watch. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And uh, definitely one of those things that, and that wins in the Big Ten West, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, again, the, the parody's there. It makes it interesting. Purdue's made it interesting. I, I really like Aiden O'Connell. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think he's a guy that I watch, and I'm wondering if he'll get a shot at the next level. Um, but again, I mean, you and I talk about this all the time. I, it, most of the storylines within the conference, and Nebraska's kind of found this out when they joined the league and I've known this my whole life, most of the storylines revolve around the big two and the big 10 East and it's on somebody. I don't know. Like I was kind of talking to somebody. I'd love to hear your opinion. Like how much does that change when you USC and UCLA come in? Do we have this, like maybe, maybe the narratives around in Ohio state change a little bit because you know what? USC and UCLA have been pretty good this year, too. Mm-hmm. I think the narrative changes, but the, the question is, is how are you going to survive week in, week out with your style of play from UCLA, USC? I mean, they have incredible recruits. They've got two uh, really good coaches. They have skill. But can UCLA and USC be – as good on the lines of scrimmage as they need to be to get through, right? That's the the big question. Yep. Finesse wise and skill wise, they're gonna do their thing, but it's a big difference to hook up with somebody in a Rose Bowl versus, uh, you know, uh, twelve weeks regular season that meat grinder that is the Big Ten. Really good, developed, grown up teams sometimes don't survive it. So that's the shift I'm looking for. And how do you how do you adapt? Or maybe it's a situation where you can't 
you can't crush what you can't catch <laughs> from a skill standpoint, right? But I think even Ohio State has shifted back a little bit from as good as they are throwing the ball all around. I think Ohio State's trying to be a more physical team this year because I think they got popped in the mouth last year. They they couldn't stand up to Michigan, and Michigan looks great again this year. Yeah, and that's still Big Ten football. I mean, to me, the the thing – that I took away from that Michigan Penn state game last week was, yeah, you, I, I was telling my kids this. I, I was like, if you run the ball and you stop the run in the big 10, good things happen. Can't speak to what will happen when you go play Georgia, Tennessee and Alabama. But <laughs> if you do this at Ann Arbor against the top 10, other big 10 team, you're going to be fine. And I, I was impressed with Michigan's offensive line. Mm-hmm. I mean, Nebraska fans that were watching that had to be like, why can't we do that? Mm-hmm. You know, we have the offensive line and the two running backs and a quarterback in J.J. McCarthy that manages the game well. I mean, it's taken Harbaugh a while, and I know you and I have talked a lot about Harbaugh over the years, but he's finally got that kind of Stanford model that he yes. had when he had Toby Gerhardt and Andrew Luck. I mean, they were good. They were borderline national championship team so it'll be interesting to see what that looks like against ohio state because i think they're still gonna i have to remind people they won the big 10 last year well and to your harbaugh point i mean he's got three tight ends and he's got three guys on the uh on the line that are nfl guys he's just gonna mash you bill bender a couple of minutes left hail varsity radio bill bender sporting news at bill bender 92 it's where you follow him on twitter i've got four other names I'm going to throw at you for the Nebraska job and just reaction. Uh, A, gettable, B, fit, Whittingham, Shaw, Fitzgerald, Bielema. Two in conference, two out of the Pac-12 that are rough and tumble. You know, Whittingham's interesting, but I don't think he's leaving Utah. I just see him as a light for there. He's, he, I feel like he would have gone somewhere had he had a chance for, and he's actually pushed Utah – into that outskirts of the playoff conversation. Shaw, I don't know if Nebraska is going there just because, like, the last couple of years, his stock's gone down a little bit. Of the four, you mentioned Bielema is the most interesting. If he One, would he take that call? Because, two, that's the guy that knows Big Ten West football. I mean, he knows what we were just talking about, who who can run the ball, stop the run, build a physical line. Um, again, if you're a Nebraska fan, you're watching Illinois, you're being like, why can't we do that? that? That's how I would feel. I mean, that's exactly how you win in this conference. I don't know if it's enough to beat Ohio State, but I don't think they care at Illinois right now, given the, um, you know, the – the downs that they've had since Coach Zook left. Mm-hmm. You think Fitz ever leaves Northwestern? I don't. I, I, again, he feels like a lifer there. He's had looks ranging from – I've had, heard you know rumors about uh, Pat Fitzgerald that have ranged from the Green Bay Packers and the Bears to Michigan to everything in between. Texas. I think he's just so into that program. One, I don't think they're going to fire him if he struggles because mm-hmm. they – you and I know what – the Dennis Green Northwestern era looks like. Um, <laughs> and they've upgraded their facility. I, I mean, remember those years where they were – I think they tore down the goalpost after they lost like 37 games, something like yeah. that. So I, I think he – he just feels like a lifer there because he loves that university, loves that area of the country so much. And I know I, you hear him at Big Ten Media Days talking about his kids being there. I, I just don't see him leaving. All right. Uh, real threat that there are – three SEC teams in the college football playoff. Do you believe it? The scenario is interesting just because um, the the Tennessee-Georgia thing is interesting to me because if Georgia beats Tennessee and Alabama beats Georgia, what do you do? Mm. And the answer is probably you got to root for other teams to lose. It's feasible. I mean, two has always kind of been assumed this year, but we just assumed it was going to be Georgia and Alabama. But – I mean, there's a long way to go that plays itself out. I think we were talking about this with my editor, Bill Troche, on our podcast this week. The uh, the interesting scenario, Chris, is if Oregon goes 12-1 and one and, and Tennessee's sitting there at 11-1. And, and they let's say they play Georgia and lose by like seven. Right. Who, who would you take? Would you take the team that lost 49-3 to three in week one or the exciting balls with that offense? And I, I think, I think that would be a very real debate. I think you take the, the Vols. Why do you think Heupel's done it so quickly there? 
offensive system. He he knows offensive football. I mean, some of the things they're doing, I mean, just the widespread stressing defense, stressed Alabama. Alabama didn't breathe on uh, Hendon Hooker. <laughs> they uh, they got one sack. They didn't get a quarterback hurt. That that astonished me, honestly, that they couldn't get any pressure on Hendon Hooker. And uh, um, I thought that would happen. I thought that would be a difference in the game, and it was a difference the other way. So, yeah, I think that's the big thing is they're, they're able to protect. They have a scheme that works. Their defense still isn't – I don't think it's quite national championship caliber. And I don't think Georgia, when they play Georgia, Georgia is not going to sit back and give Hendon Hooker all day. They're going to come after him. Bill Bender, Sporting News. Bill, about uh, 60 seconds, real quick NFL thoughts. Who flips their season around first? Tom in Tampa, uh, your Packers and Aaron Rodgers, or Russ in Denver? Uh, probably Tampa Bay because of the division. I think Green Bay is going to – it's going to be a struggle. I mean, they may get to a wild card, but their offense is really bad. And I don't know if Aaron Rodgers at 38 can fix that. Mm-hmm. So, um, they they just haven't run the ball effectively. The O-line play isn't there. They're not good at any position group right now on offense. So, maybe it's good enough to get to 9-8. and eight. I, I think Tom and the Bucks ha- have a – easiest division easiest path to do it and they'll get it going and then russ i mean got injured this week it just hasn't worked out so my answer would probably be tampa bay but even if green bay struggles i mean as a packers fan it's like well it's got to happen sometime (laughs) bill bender bill have a good week thanks for the time today hey no problem thanks for having me Good to chat with Bill Bender. We'll do a jock talk on the way. Reminder to get buckled up, hands on the wheel, eyes and mind. Straight ahead, the driver has one job, that's to drive. Get buckled up. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Hail Varsity continues, presented by Currency. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now. Say my name. It's Schmitty on Hail Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut, pre-teen Swedish boy. Back into it, it's Hail Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. We welcome in Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center, a Jack Doc Wednesday. Dr. Brandon, all sorts of walking wounded in the NFL. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, man. That is the truth, though. There seems like the injuries are starting to really pile up. They are, and uh, old Hollywood Brown, Marquise Brown for Arizona, he's expected to miss six weeks, uh, a non-surgical fracture. Uh, lay that out for me here. You look at the length of time and the part of the body here. What what do you uh, think is going on here with Hollywood? Yeah, we do kind of have to speculate a little bit about uh, where this is, as I'm thinking about as, as they're talking about his injury in the paper and going to be six weeks out, not as a non-operative kind of fracture. So you kind of speculate as to what that would be. My assumption here would be this is probably dealing with that fifth metatarsal again. That's that bone off the outside coming off the small toe. You know, we've talked about that before in here called a Jones fracture, which is where uh, you kind of move up to right where the end of the bone kind of forms into the middle shape shaft part where that fracture happens those typically are always fixed with surgery this injury he probably has would be at the tip of that bone which is where one of the tendons that attaches to it called the perineus brevis attaches to and it can kind of pull that little bony piece off the end my assumption here would be is that's probably what he has that's kind of a typical four to six weeks out non-operative treatment course obviously really based upon you know how their symptoms are that would be my assumption for him. The other alternative to that would be is if they did an MRI and they found that maybe he had a big kind of deep bone bruise and something like maybe his talus or navicular, which would be one of those you could treat non-operatively if it's just a bad bone bruise. It's kind of like a precursor to a stress fracture. That may also be what this is. And so, again, we're kind of speculating here. Again, I would kind of lead us down that pathway, though, of that uh, kind of what we call a pseudo-Jones or fake Jones fracture, which is at the tip of that fifth metatarsal. Sorry to bombard you with all this anatomy. No, it's all right. I, I didn't pass it the first time. I need to retake it. So, <laughs> Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Holly, Hollywood Brown, our, our player topic today. And, you know, Dr. Brandon, when, when we look at uh, that injury uh, on the foot, how and, and where can it happen? 
I look at Brown and and I look at how just difference making he has been for for the Cards at wide receiver. Uh, but it's not uncommon to have foot injuries with a guy that's using his legs so much. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, this is one of those injuries that you either can go from having like an ankle sprain, kind of rolling that foot to the side, so it's either going to be ankle sprain or that uh, twisting and force mechanism really kind of goes into the tip of that bone and that uh, ligament that's there, that perineus, perineus brevis, will kind of pull off the tip of that bone. So it's really kind of almost a variant, if you will, of an ankle sprain, um, kind of a different animal than, you know, say your kind of standard run-of-the-mill ankle sprain. But any type of kind of twisting event where you're planting that foot rotates out to the side or even in particular that foot kind of rolls over off to the side where you're kind of pushing off the balls of your feet, that's where we tend to see this. It's, it's kind of a significant kind of torquing and rolling mechanism, usually what accounts for this injury. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us here on Hale Varsity Radio, another Jock Doc Wednesday. And Dr. Brandon, whenever I, 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 I think about this, I mean, Schmidt, he's had a lot of walking wounded in the NFL, but with a foot fracture, is he going to be allowed to be weight-bearing over the next couple of weeks while he recovers here? I know he was on a, in a walking boot as he left the stadium on Sunday, but is this something where they're going to try to take some of the weight off of this foot over the next couple of weeks while they, they let this heal? Yeah, that's a great question. They might, that first kind of seven to ten days, they may do that, especially if he has you know a significant amount of swelling. That's a good move, just to kind of get some soft tissue rest. And obviously he's in the boot, and so once you're in that boot, you can start to put some weight on it. And really these are fractures that you want to get going in terms of the range of motion. So he'll be kind of plugged into a therapy program to make sure they keep that uh, ankle range of motion up for him so he doesn't stiffen up. Um, in terms of, you know, obviously, the weight-bearing stuff, again, it's pretty variable that first week or two. But after that, usually they get after this right away with weight-bearing, um, again, if we're kind of assuming that's what this fracture is. Um, and then from there, once you start to get in that rehab program, before you're really doing kind of that explosive stuff, it really does kind of take about four to six weeks or more to get back to that level. Let's talk a little bit about what he can do in the meantime, just from an activity standpoint, if anything, how has he eased in? Uh, what are the the options rehab-wise? Yeah, and so, you know, first you start out with doing some of the, we call kind of alter G, uh, kind of limited uh, weight kind of training. So you're doing like, you know, biking, stationary biking, then you kind of move the elliptical, maybe just biking outdoors, then you kind of move into the jogging, maybe in one of those, you uh, know, uh, Ultra G trainers where they kind of change the gravity force, and then you move into regular jogging. That's kind of that natural progression. Obviously, you want to be back to kind of straight line sprinting before you start to do the cutting piece of this. But you can progress those pretty quickly. Again, the challenging part with these is, is they're really variable in terms of how quickly patients recover. It really is kind of based on just their symptoms. Um, I've had some of these uh, athletes that feel great after three or four weeks, and so I have them out there already doing, you know, twisting, uh, cutting activities that you know three or four weeks uh, but most of these don't feel good doing that till about five or six weeks dr brandon seifert with us here another jock doc wednesday and dr brandon whenever you're talking about the wide receiver position especially a guy like hollywood brown that loves to use his speed and, and quickly get in and out of routes all, all that cutting uh, I, i'll just be honest here i got offered a buy low opportunity with marquise brown in, in my <laughs> fantasy football league what do you think of, of his of his prospects feel that to be that same player that he was early in the season whenever he comes back after suffering an injury like this? Ah, that's a tough one, buddy. That was a tough call. You know, I'm thinking by eight weeks, he probably looks pretty good if this is really kind of the injury he has. Um, but that's still a little questionable. I don't think I'd roll the dice on that one. Especially with DeAndre Hopkins coming into the fold here and I'm Robbie gonna, Anderson. I'm going to drop Hollywood from my team here after this <laughs> diagnosis from Dr. <laughs> Brandon Seifert. Uh, our fantasy doc, baby. I love it uh, with Nebraska Orthopedic Center. I haven't signed Center. my contract yet financially for you guys, giving you this advice. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you half my winnings if I win the league, okay? Oops. Uh, we're, we're breaking up here, Dr. Brandon. Uh <laughs> <laughs> with uh, with with the contract talk, hey, awesome to catch up as always. Thanks for the insight, Doctor uh, Doctor Brandon. We'll do this again soon. All right, thanks, fellas. Take care. Good stuff, Doctor Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center, a jock doc, Hollywood uh, on the mend. Get your tickets now. Red Zone tickets selling fun since two thousand one. Do you have tickets you're wanting to buy? to a Husker event or a concert or even some Creighton basketball. Maybe you're looking to get rid of some seats. 
Uh, Red Zone Tickets can help you do that. They are uh, your go-to source, and they are local. They are out of Omaha, A-plus Better Business Bureau rating. How's that for metrics? They make it uh, happen for you when it comes to 100% guarantee on all orders, authentic tickets for you, and you will be able to go to make those memories, cross off some big-time uh, events on your bucket list. You always wanted to see Dave Matthews in concert. Well, he's at CHI coming up here Michigan weekend. So uh, think about that. Also, Nebraska, Illinois, want to go check that game out, 2.30 kickoff. Uh, your friends at Red Zone Tickets can make it happen. Log on today, redzonetickets.com. That's redzonetickets.com. A uh, Dr. Lou non-love note on the way. It's Hale Varsity presented by Currency. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HaleVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time, big thanks to Ron Brown and, uh, of course, Bill Bender, Mike Babcock, and Mike Schuhart tomorrow. Coach Barnett back with us and Jeremiah Searles. Brandon Vogel, we will bother him during the bye week. Some thoughts to look forward to at Nebraska. Also, Husker Volleyball recap from Vogue's. That is tomorrow. Really good comedy show. Going to be up at the Hale Varsity Club on Friday. Uh, we are not at the Hale Varsity Club this Friday with the bye week, but check out uh, HaleVarsityClub.com for info on comedy. Got a great podcast coming up, too. I believe Verz and Tommy Frazier are mm-hmm. going to be there Monday at 6 doing their pod live so check all that out uh with uh, verse and uh touchdown tommy Remember, that's, that's a new pod isn't it i think so the, i think the, it's 50, 51 51 15, 51, 15 right. their numbers i believe that's uh it's a new a uh, new podcast from the herd family yep, network absolutely so. uh be sure to check out uh, Shick and nick's pod as well with uh, their sit down with mickey joseph Really good stuff there. Do we have time for, for Dr. Lou, courtesy of... Uh, Cutting one, it real close. Might as well try to get some of it right, Let's get uh, some of uh, Pat McAfee and uh, Dr. Lou a, well, a torrid letter to uh, those Notre Dame fans. Coach Freeman, I hoped I would have left to send you another one of these letters, but here we are. I'd say I hope this finds you well, but to be honest, at this point, I don't give a shit. I've been sitting here in my coach's office for the last 48 hours. Haven't moved since Saturday <laughs> because I'm just sick to my stomach at the effort that those boys displayed. You getting beat by Stanford at home? <laughs> at home against Stanford? Jesus Christ, you made that McKee kid look like Jim Plunkett. Stanford stinks, we all know it. You were supposed to beat the hell out of them. And now you got UNLV next week. And then Syracuse and Clemson. We might lose our next three games. Now listen, okay. I'll be honest, I mean, it's tough for me to even write this letter because, like I said, I don't care anymore. The season's over. We're dead. At the University of Notre Dame, we care about national championships. And I hear, you know, you're going to have to be getting your fans riled up saying, go and get your tickets to the Monarchy Car Care Bowl. How the hell is anybody supposed to care about that? (laughs) You've done some good things while head coach of Notre Dame. You converted to Catholicism, which I love, okay? I really do. Getting closer to our Lord and Savior is one of the staples of being a great head football coach at the University of Notre Dame. But you know what else I'd like you to convert? Maybe some (laughs) third downs. Three of 12 last week? (laughs) I'm at a loss of words, Marcus. I really am. Oh, wow. I want to be in your corner. I want to tell you how much I love what you've been doing and what the boys have been doing. But let's be honest. You guys f- stink. 
Oh, Dr. Lou. A great impression from uh, the Pat McAfee show. Tomorrow, back at four with Hale Varsity, presented by Currency. Have a good night.